segments. Today is the official day. The Big 12 invited, and then today they are official. As a part of the conference, the four schools that came in from what was then the Pac-12, Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, and also Utah that day. And it's not the only conference that was official today, but we'll get to that. The Big 12 today, and I remember driving down Florida to go see my brothers last summer, and you guys had the Colorado story was popping. It was like on a Thursday, and here we are uh, about a year later, and everything is official. Yep. Um, it's weird that, like, you have a media days uh, almost a month before you can actually say the teams are in the conference. I know that's a formality, but, yeah, here they are uh, in there. i I always wonder, like, why conferences have different dates. Like, wouldn't it be easier if they all got together and said, <laughs> June 30th, across the board? Uh, that way we know. But it, it's not that way. And so, yeah, they're all here and, uh, you know, 16 teams. Yeah, it's awesome. Congratulations to those four schools and everybody else who's moved around officially today. I'm glad to see that they're a part of the Big 12, even though uh, they – been in my mind for a while now including as Paul said media days this is more of a formality and making everything uh, on the contracts you know the ink dried and everything filed away properly and and all official and it can be put away and we can all move forward to this next chapter and what that's going to look like with a 16 team big 12 and then obviously again uh, other variations and other conferences but yeah I hope those four schools and their fan bases are excited I know that Initially, especially this time last year, there's a lot of strife and a lot of anger and a lot of disappointment and a lot of just emotions flying around because of all the other things that were swirling around. But I think in the time since then, uh, based on the majority of what I've seen uh, from those four schools and their fan bases, yeah, there's a little tiff and it's kind of almost become like a bit of Utah on Twitter and some of their fans. But uh, I've seen a lot of very supportive and excited Utah fans. I don't fault anybody for liking things the way that they were. You know, if the Big 12 fractured and broke apart, I'm sure there would be people pining initially to have it the way that it was. But we all know this is a new world. We've had a year to digest it. And I think at this point, everybody's excited about what this looks like. And I think you see, you know, articles by Bill Connolly on ESPN. And we've had various other people join us this offseason who have talked about how exciting this league should be. Don't know how many national champions will come out of this league, but it'll be top to bottom one of the deepest and most competitive, and I'm looking forward to seeing what that looks like. I am, too. A lot of you already in the chat room. By the way, David Jolly joined us. He's a Utah fan. We've got a couple of segments on the Utes, uh, one of them with a, uh, a Big 12 advisory board member uh, in Sylvester Stevenson, a former Utah great. He'll join us, and also their play-by-play -play voice will join us today uh, a little bit later on in the show, and that is Bill Riley. But we will have Max Olson today, Grayson Grunhafer, one of our favorite, and Matt McChesney, the former Colorado defensive lineman, he'll join us, go full throttle with us today. Now, that was the, uh, the uh, welcome. Here is also what Big 12 Conference put out, the EA Sports video game. Look at the logo in the bottom right-hand corner with those four players, and then also the Big 12 logo. That was yet another part of the welcoming. And then Paul found this gem from a UCF fan. Reddit put it up. This is the... Oh, it's from UCF. Oh, it's from UCF. It's from UCF. It, it is the, uh, the uh, Big 12 family portrait. Why, why Paul, that, that everyone, right? All 16 are right there. Yes, all 16 teams. And the funny part about it is that Utah is there right above BYU, all those mascots. And Utah looks a little forlorn about it, which was kind of their fans... Uh, response. They were a little tepid about having to be in the Big 12, which is understandable considering that they had just won when they found out that they were going to a different conference, back-to-back Pac-12 titles, and now have to go into a new league with a rival that um, we'll just call it contentious with BYU, their relationship at um, mostly. So uh, I think it was very clever on the graphic artist to uh, make the, the Utah mascot look a little bit like, okay, great, yep. it's starting now. We know that that's not necessarily the case for most of the fans, but it was like kind of the running inside joke. Yeah, they were, they were in some cases, you kind of thought they were being pulled and uh, as they were trying to hold on to the door before they're on their way out. But we got a couple of segments on them. I'm a great. I'm happy. I, I think they play great level of brand of football. I'm looking forward to watching Utah. And Baylor gets to see them awfully early in week number two of the season. Now, here's another conference that was, of course, official today. The ACC 
with what they have. There's another t- there's a family portrait of the three newbies from Cal and Stanford, the Cardinal, and SMU. That came from the SMU family as they're the new, three members of, of the new the three new members of what is now the expanded ACC. Yeah, I'd feel confident putting my next paycheck that uh, the Big 12 is far more excited about their new members than the ACC is about their new members overall. As far as the fans and what they enjoy and what they are excited about, I don't see a lot of pro these three when it comes to a lot of the ACC fans I come across, unless it's in a battle where all of a sudden the ACC's got to, like, you know, cross its own line and, like, gang up together to fight against, you know, some – SEC guy or something like that. Then they then they kind of you know Pitt fan will come together with a North Carolina fan or something. But yeah, you mean you talk about contentious? I don't know if that's the exact word to use, but it's pretty close to the exact word to use for that conference right now. And a lot of the blowback I have seen has been bringing these three in, and particularly SMU. But for SMU fans, oh. me personally, I'm happy for them. The ones that aren't complete jackholes, that, uh, you know, aren't uh, your stereotypical Richie Rich SMU fans, they are very obnoxious, and I I don't enjoy seeing much of their interactions. But the real SMU fan that's not trying to, like, be a bit, basically, I think there's a lot of cool folks that I know, and uh, I'm excited for them because I know what a long, hard road that was being an SMU fan for so long and being out in the wilderness just kind of wandering around, and now they've put their money where their mouth is. They got their opportunity, and, you know, let's see what they do with it. And for Cal and Stanford, I mean, I I don't know much. I I can't pretend to really know much about how their fan bases feel because I don't come across them all that often, I feel like. But I I do know those are really good schools, and – Right now, you're hearing a lot about their athletes with the Olympics going on, and that's certainly going to be a boon for the ACC. Uh, various sports are going to get uh, well, going to see a huge uptick. They, they yeah. have the most Olympians. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, which is always kind of fun know, to go with that. I think about this with Stanford quite a bit. It's 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 not the exact same way with Cal. Cal has more um, people who cover their their athletics and football program, in particularly. But Soki. We were at the radio station when we started this, and it was every week during the season I would do a uh, a national, like, outside of the Big 12, or even the Big 12, but, like, someone that was outside of Baylor, yep. a college football segment that was about a 10- to 15-minute interview. And I easily got someone for every school that was playing well or every big story. So if it was Appalachian State with a big upset, I easily got somebody. It took me, and this was – the second year maybe we were doing it, Stanford was on like a six-game winning streak. And I said, hey, we need to get somebody for Stanford. It took me three weeks later, and the winning streak was over, to finally get in touch with somebody who covered Stanford because they just don't have a lot of people that cover football yeah. um, for them. So it's it's kind of a different thing, which is, again, very odd to me because they've been good in it. I mean, it's it's not something that this is – you know, the the thousand years of darkness that Kansas State went through in the pre-Bill Snyder era. Like, for the most part, over Stanford's history, they've had good runs. Yeah, they've had they've had sections of nice runs, and they've had players like a Jim Plunkett and a John Elway, among, you know, many others. Uh, who's the uh, – oh, my God, I just went blank. Who's the uh, – there's a running back. That Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, Christian McCaffrey, uh, who, who's uh, uh, MVP Toby type. Gerhardt. Yeah, oh, no, a bunch. <laughs> Touchdown, so, um, Tommy Vardell. So here is uh, another note. This is from Cal. The future starts now. The Golden Bears are officially members of the ACC. So we've got some of these that I wanted to post here. And then the Big Ten. Let's not forget them. Never been stronger as they, of course, and that's a picture that uh, if you click on it, I think below, but that's okay, uh, of all the new members, the 18 of the Big Ten. I don't know if you guys saw this one, but somebody put up a note about the three conferences today that got bigger, the ACC officially, and then, of course, the, uh, the Big Ten and also the Big 12. There is a tweet from Greg Sankey, a video, where he's kind of like raising his hand. Hey, how about us? They've already had their official date. And they added Texas and also Oklahoma. Yeah, I don't know what that tweet was looking at. That was a month ago. They did that already. They had the big party that they spent like a couple million dollars on in Austin to celebrate. So, yeah, like was it Pitbull or whoever yeah. appeared yep. there? So, yeah, yep. they already had their whole deal. We've been there, done that. And so that that joke doesn't exactly hit for me. It's, it's not really like totally accurate, but I guess I see where it's coming from. And, yeah, I think the other part about that joke that doesn't really work is if – 
he doesn't have to sit there and do that. Like, if he wants to go get somebody, he can go get anybody from basically two of those three conferences could, that he wants right now. He can so, make each one of those conferences have less teams. But I appreciate the call. effort. Yeah. I just don't think that it really yeah. hit fully, you know. Uh, but. I, I've got to go back to uh, the Cal thing. Um, there is a saying, they, they used a saying that I, I've never liked, and I know this is nitpicky and silly, but it's called, it's the future is now. Well, it's not. The now is the present. The future is later. Oh, okay. Like it's so. It always always bothered yeah. me when they're like, "The future is now." Like, no, no. It, the, the Wasn't present. that George Allen's Riley cry when he joined the Washington Redskins back in the early seventies? Yeah. That was a book called "The Future Is Now." Was his yeah. was his deal when yeah. they took a bunch and of? I get the. I get what they're trying to say, but it's one of those things that's always bothered yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> You're getting too technical, man. I know. It don't, just always. Hey, but don't no. make me don't Features. make me start having to think through that. That's today, like Jennifer in the flat earth. Today I learned uh, Cal's motto is the yeah. future is now. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. never even noticed that. Here's but. one from John Wilner, who of course was a big part of a lot of the coverage as the Pac-12 was trying to. There was somebody that put up like four different clips from George Klyovkov, uh, uh that were man, all. Man, those aged so oh, terribly. My God. The yeah. one clip from last year's. Uh, media days where you know he t- he made the comment about we'll see when we go shopping or whatever the exact quote was uh-huh. uh, Brett your market made the comment about the big 12 being open for business and Klyovkov was asked about that and he's he said whatever he said and then he, he basically finished it by we haven't decided if we're going to go shopping there yet, in, shopping there yet or not indicating that when or if they wanted to they were going to be the ones to go on the hunt and that age you know, obviously very poorly, but well, to see that for the first time in about yeah. 11 months uh, was, yeah, I was like, oh, wow, I was, I was shot back to the past for a brief second, but then I, I think now with the year's worth of just kind of getting over all of the spinning madness of everything just kind of going on at once back then and just sitting back and looking at it, I was like, oh, yeah, that was really poorly <laughs> executed. That was not or the, great then or now, even still. The, yeah, The one where he said, the longer we wait, we know we're going to get a bigger deal because I know the truth. Here's one from John <laughs> Wilner. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. Yeah. Oh, for, the, I forgot about that one. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot. And, and by the way, John made it official today about his, it's the Wilner hotline, not the Pac-12 hotline. And John, of course, uh, he had some reporting where I think he was in belief that the Pac-12 would stay together, and we had him on during the, the not-so-sure times, and he's been on with us, and he's going to cover the Big 12, the schools that are a part of it that are in his coverage area. Ask Jerry Jones, George Klyovkov, how how much money yeah. you save or how much money you make uh, when the deadlines make deals thing happens. And everybody that signs in front of your guys are making more now than you are going to have to pay them. Wilner. Uh, uh, hotline comments, Big 12 with the corner schools now official. The conference has pretty much done everything right with every aspect of the onboarding process, except Kansas and Arizona men's basketball should be playing twice. Come on. I mean, come on. That's from John Wilner from the Wilner hotline. Yeah, I'm not sure what they could have done otherwise that would be something that would make the onboarding process any better. It seems like it's been pretty smooth sailing and everybody's on the same page. And, and obviously today's the big day for – all the parties involved, but yeah, that's uh that's certainly a a critique that I think plenty of people would jump on board with the college basketball hoop heads. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. sure they would love to see that game twice, and and that was definitely one of their initial reactions to the basketball schedule being released. Was how are you not putting up uh, Kansas and Arizona in a home and home? And I'm sure there's a reason for that. Like, I don't think that that's just some oversight. I don't think that the Big 12 is perfect. I think there is going to be a time or two and has been where they're going to make the wrong decision on something and something gets overlooked or something along those lines but until um you know we see uh, i guess uh, i guess for this year at least i'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt i feel like there's a reason like the computer spit that out or right. a traveling thing but yeah you would have loved to have seen kansas arizona and basketball twice so maybe we'll get that second meeting in the big 12 tournament which ought to be, you know, as spicy as ever as well, and, and we'll get that second meeting. I know but. Baylor fans would like to see home and away with KU, but that's not going to be the case right. this year. So Part now, of having so let's many get schools. to some football. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You can't – everyone can't play everybody a couple of different times. So let's get to a couple of football thoughts. Uh, a lot of schools, everybody opening up this week as far as football practices. That Florida State-Georgia Tech game is not that far away on the 24th, I think it is. Uh, with the opening game of the college football season. Dave Aranda, Baylor, um, they have not yet named a quarterback, the starting quarterback, whether Daquan Finn, the transfer from Toledo, or Sawyer Robertson back from another year. Here's a quick little hit with him after practice yesterday with Dave Aranda and the question about playing at quarterback. I know it's just day one. Are you any closer to a 
decision at quarterback? No, it's good things though. I thought you know we have uh, put ups and call ups at the end of practice. So the put ups if, if guys are doing you know positive things and a call up if a guy's below the line needs to get called up and uh, guys were able to uh, to put up uh, DQ. So it was really good. And so I think uh, good first day for him. Sawyer's battling and doing doing his stuff, and so I'm excited to see. Coach, is there any concern that comes to mind when you bring in a guy like Daquan, and I'm sure the NIL era he was compensated fairly. In, mm -hmm. There seems like a motivation from the outside to make him a starter, and he proves it. To this point, there hasn't been that clear uh, area. Is, is that concern? I'm really concerned about winning games, and so I'm basically concerned about that. That did that, uh, and uh, what was the question about whether or not um, that concerns bringing about Daquan. bringing a guy in through the NIL, like with DeQuan Finn, as far as yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I I don't I just don't know why we need to be worried about that right this very yeah. second. Like, I mean, can we let? Let him not be named the starter first. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think sometimes we start to get try to get too far ahead of ourselves. It's practice number one, and I think just him simply answering the "is there a starting quarterback?" questions enough fodder for the day. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that's that's more of a question for like if two weeks from now they're naming Sawyer Robertson the starting quarterback. That'd be a valid question because you invested in DeQuan Finn and he's not your starter, and that would be looked at as a problematic decision you made because you're suddenly you know putting a lot of money into a guy who's not even your starting quarterback that you could have spent elsewhere like oh I don't know offensive line for example uh so yeah that, there's a time and place for that question but day number one I wasn't expecting anything crazy um and and certainly I know we all look for the drama but uh that, that'll come in time well, regardless I, I think Dave it was short and yeah, sweet and yeah. ready to worry about football so there we are I did see Grayson on a couple of notes he'll join us in about well, 30 minutes on he was at practice in a couple, of, a lot of nuggets from what he saw the first day. And, and we didn't get to see anything in the spring, you know, when it came to the actual QB competition. And look, Daquan Finn was just here learning a new offense and new signals and all that stuff. Sawyer Robertson, here longer, but still a new offense than he was running last year. And, you know, just kind of talking to the coaches the other night, um, they feel good but not great about where things stand just because neither one of them has taken control. Uh, of it because in the spring it was Daquan would have a good day and Sorry would have a bad day and then and then they'd flip it the next day. Um, and, but again, that's in the spring. Like you can't really put so much on that, especially now with the transfer portal and coaching changes and all that. The real test comes now as they get ready for actual games. If that continues, then they've got a problem. If it doesn't continue well, and either one separates themselves or both of them are really good, then that's not a problem. They need both of them to push each other. Yeah. They need both of them to be razor sharp. Pat Smith with this story. The NCAA releasing today that Kentucky football, two years probation, and have to vacate uh, games after the use of ineligible players for a couple of years. 11 players received payment for work that was not performed. Here's that vacation. We were just talking about Greg Hill yesterday. Yeah. This is that kind of same thing. Yep. yep. So uh, there. Just means two, more. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah and I, when I saw that and I saw NCAA in Kentucky, I'm thinking Calipari left just in time. And then, of course, he's now at Arkansas. Here's a couple of notes on the ACC. Uh, this, this is kind of a, a fun little run here. Brian Murphy he said, it's been reported many places, ESPN, ACC documents. ESPN has the exclusive revocable uh, option, but not obligation to extend. So an opt-in rather than an opt-out might be the case when, of course, there was the thought that ESPN could opt out. Dennis Dodd follows up with this one. It's been widely, widely reported ESPN had an option in the contract in February of next year. Here are the details via the contract. My question, wouldn't ESPN want cost certainty and stability in extending to 2036? What am I missing? Matt Baker responded. Here's a hypothetical. Is it better, cheaper for ESPN to pay for FSU plus Clemson in the SEC or to pay for FSU plus Clemson and Wake and BC et al. in the ACC? See, that's where I get in the, like, in the forest – in this ACC thing when it comes to ESPN's ability to opt into the media deal, I guess, since it's not an opt-out. If they really wanted 
to stop paying the schools that don't get them ratings. Now, Craig always brings up a good point on that is, are you really going to tell Wake Forest and Boston College, like, sorry? Yeah, like, I, that's that's yeah. where, you know, in the cold-hearted business sense of it, you would be like, well, of course, they're just going to tell Clem, the ones that they want from from the ACC, we're going to opt out of this deal. We're not going to opt into the deal. It's over. You guys are out. Go where you want, and we'll use that. We'll allot that money elsewhere, and then the ACC can come in and get an old Conference USA deal. Like that. That's the cold hearted part of it but then are they really going to do that to Syracuse and Pitt and all those ones Craig's always had that kind of point about it uh yeah so I I just don't understand how you're going to go tell Boston College and Pitt and Syracuse and all them to kick rocks but hey we're going to want your basketball later Mm -hmm. and uh we're still going to like use you if we can later on but we're going to throw middle fingers in your face basically kill you off and then just get what we can out of your lifeless body and just go about our business and take what we want and there's going to be no repercussions I just don't see it. How are there not repercussions? Like, how is – if you're to sit there and basically kick 10 schools to the curb or 10-plus schools to the curb, and I know others might have landing spots that's been talked about ad nauseum. I didn't see the Big 12 included in the Florida State-Clemson line there, by the way. Mm-hmm. But um, I, just, I just don't know business-wise. Like, can you, can you do that and not suffer from that? Dissolving a conference that was under contract to you to then benefit yourself and this other conference, and then others are supposed to still continue doing business with you and trust you, and there's nothing that's out of bounds with all of that? That just seems to me like it would be problematic. And and maybe I'm just naive, and I don't understand that, no, you can do that, and there's no repercussions, and nobody can do anything about it and all that. Maybe that's the case. I don't know. I just feel like that's like a really poor business move is to tank one of the brands you're paying for and have a network for to pull two brands to add to the brand you have elsewhere and then just tell the others to kick rocks or I don't know, maybe you help usher them some, but that's the part that just doesn't make sense to me of like, this isn't like trash in your car that you can just like take anywhere and just leave it and, like you know, these like are when, schools when and universities. Even Sonic, there's that trash can always yeah. on the left side. You could throw a couple of cups in there. That's what it would be like. Dude, like you, you keep what you want and then you just throw everything. Like I just, there's contracts there. And, and I know there's all this talk about the contract and how valid it is and how you know locked in it is and everything. But I don't know. I just, I, I understand wanting the best brands, and the best brands, but I, I don't know. Ultimately you're still going to have to do business with these other schools at some point in some fashion. And that just feels like really bad business and it feels like it could be problematic, well, but maybe I just, I, but, I don't know enough. But here's what I think about um, when David Zaslav took over uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, which he may not have that job very much longer because he lost the NBA. But one of the things they did was they had full produced movies that were done and ready to be released that they thought they wouldn't recoup on. And they just charged them off for the insurance. So if ESPN and Disney has that same belief about the long-term future of the ACC, that's where that comes in. And then you send them off to Warner Brothers Discovery and TNT and the CW and all those things to make a new TV deal. Because you're like, look, we're not going to do this anymore, but we know that they have inventory for that because we made sure that they didn't get the the NBA back. So here you go. But again... To your point, Craig, that's really callous, and it's costing them. They want ACC basketball, right? When they want basketball on, right, after it's over, yeah. they're going to want that conference. And unless they just say, well, no, it, we, as long as we can find Duke a good spot among the other ones that are, are good, then, then we're fine. You know, that, that to me is where I agree with you. It's just, just almost beyond the pale of callous in business. All right, we need to break. Craig, you respond. Well, you've got a break to get to Max uh, on time. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I don't follow, follow, you know anything else? No. Uh, there is one basketball note. Uh, A.J. DeBonsta, who is the number one rated men's basketball player in the country, released his list of seven finalists. Alabama, Auburn, Baylor, BYU, Kansas, Kansas State, four consecutive Big 12 teams, and also the Tar Heels of North Carolina. This guy is extra special. We'll watch YouTube highlights of him. That was released today, his top seven schools. When we come back, Max Olson now with ESPN. Grayson Grunday for today with 365 Sports. I got a little bit of breaking news here from Dave Wilson. We just had on the show yesterday. 
Former TCU coach Gary Patterson Baylor have jointly concluded their official partnership. According to Baylor, we are truly grateful for everything he has contributed and wish him all the best as he embarks on the next chapter of his storied career. So that didn't even make it to football season. We had asked Dave Aranda, and now his answer makes a little bit more sense. You know who tried to call Now him? puzzle pieces are starting to fall into place here a little bit. We asked Dave Aranda at Media Days, I did, about Gary Patterson's role, and he was kind of squirrely and didn't really answer the question. And I followed back around, and I remember I was like, why does this feel so weird? Like, why is this not just a straightforward thing? He's on, he's helping, like, why Why does this feel like it's not just straightforward? And he made the comment about they're not going to have him at games, and that was more of a Gary decision than everything. And that's where we kind of left it was he's still helping out, but he's not going to be, you know, any more official, and he's not going to even be at game days. Doesn't want to be a distraction. And now here this is a month later, so that's I'm, very interesting. I'm going to find out what happened. Uh, there's a couple of people that used to coach at Baylor that are pretty close with Gary Patterson that I'm going to uh, – uh, that are no longer on the staff. I'm going to get in touch with them. One of them tried to call me today. We could never connect because I was in meetings all day. Thank you, Craig, for adding that to the mix. And you're right about Aranda's response. Max 